Hello and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, welcome. I'm so happy you're here. My name is Hannah and on my channel I post a ton of anti-MLM content. I will link a playlist right here. Right now there's almost 70 anti-MLM videos on there. There's deep dives, there's MLM top fails, there's Zoom calls I've snuck into, and there's videos like this one, MLM Horror Stories. This is a series of videos on my channel where I read the personal experiences that people have sent in to me. Ideally, this is your own experience in an MLM, but I've also featured stories of people who are explaining what it was like to try and be recruited into one and just general run-ins with MLMs throughout the years. And if at any point you have your own MLM horror story that you wanna send in to me, my inbox is always open. You can always shoot me an email. I've left my email address in the description box below. And the last little thing is that if any of this kind of content sounds interesting to you, I would love it if you would consider subscribing, consider liking this video. All of those things really help to support my channel and I appreciate you so much for doing that. Without further ado, let's get into the stories. This first story says, Hi Hannah, I've been thinking for way too long now about sharing my experience in an MLM but I need to get it off my chest. First of all, excuse me if there are any typos or anything misspelled, English is not my native language. My horror story is related to no other than Monate. Ugh, I know. I personally feel like I have the most beef with Monate. I feel like I dislike them the most out of all of the MLMs. What's your least favorite MLM? I would love to know. I started my business back in spring 2019 when the company was about to be five years old. You know, a baby ground floor opportunity. I saw a girl I knew from high school posting about the success stories of other people in her stories and I just replied that it was so cool. Of course, she took the opportunity to pitch the opportunity and called me that day or the next day. It was weird because I hadn't talked to her in ages and she was telling me about her entire life. She told me how vulnerable, broke, and desperate she was before joining and how awesome it is now. During the call, she guided me through the website until the point where you put all of your personal information to join. I asked her why it was asking me for my social security number first red flag. She mentioned that it's because of taxes, it is a real company, and all of that. I said I was going to think about it. Now that I'm writing this, I remember trainings where you had to do the same thing to sign people up. Oh lord. Yes, actually, there was a Zoom call training that I featured on my channel. I'll go back and I'll find that video and I'll link it right here, where they were advising their Monate market partners to be with their prospect on the phone, FaceTime, in person, and literally walk them through step by step by step, ensuring that they do fill it all out and they do give all their personal information and you watch them click the button to sign up. They framed it like, we just wanna be there for support in case they have any questions, but no. They advise that you do that so that you can't chicken out. If I am on FaceTime with a Monate Market partner who is trying to recruit me, it's gonna be a lot easier for me to ignore the red flags and to just move past it and to just sign up anyway because I don't want confrontation. It would be awkward if we're in the middle of this process and I'm like, I don't know, it doesn't feel right. You are much less likely to not follow through with it if they've got you on the phone. It is a lot easier for you to just say, ah, no, 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 this sounds weird. I'm not going to do it if it's just you by yourself on your computer. I did try to do some research. I googled the company. I read the rules of the company, the small fine print, etc. Most of what I found were things the company created or their own websites. I hope Google searches nowadays pop up at least some anti-MLM content. Unfortunately, at the time, I didn't find anything related to lawsuits or pyramid schemes. I wish I had. And that is why I sit here doing what I'm doing. I'm sure that my Google results, if I were to search it right now, would probably be skewed because I search anti-MLM stuff all the time. But this exact point of you saying, I hope if someone in search of information comes across this stuff, that is why I make these videos. My hope is that someone will go to YouTube and they'll type in Monate product review or Monate business opportunity or Monate compensation plan. And these videos will come up because they're not readily available through a Google search. And the company itself, of course, doesn't post this stuff. Most of the things that you search about these companies are going to be skewed towards a more positive light, but that's not gonna stop me from speaking out because the other side of it needs to be told too. I'll try to make the rest short. I was one of the lucky ones, one of the consistent ones. I was able to complete and get a bonus for the Mo neighborhood, which is three market partners and 12 VIPs within the first 90 days. Yes, thank you for explaining that. If you do recruit that many people and you get that many VIP customers, you get like a big bonus for it. It's part of the Monate smart start period is what they call, so like you said, in your first 90 days, if you complete these tasks, you get extra money, basically. I earned trips, I ranked up, etc. A lot of these people were family members. I feel really bad now, but they quit too, thank God. The business was very unsteady. Right after I finished them on neighborhood, it was really hard to find new people. Then another good season came in, and for the next few months, I was able to get like one market partner per month or so. In my entire time with the company, I recruited around 12 to 15 people, and I had like 60 VIP customers. Within a year, I was able to get to the A 
AMM rank, which is one rank below market mentor, the Cadillac rank. Now I'm so grateful I never got to that freaking rank because I'd feel so ashamed now of having a Monate Drives Me license plate. Even though I made it to the top 1% or so, I wasn't even at the middle rank. The most I received in a monthly check was around $2,000. While that might seem like a lot for some, it was only one time because it was extremely difficult to re-rank. My checks went down to around $500 a month. I had my primary source of income from my job and this was just another stream of income, but it was so frustrating. I am living for this story right now. This is what we need to hear more of. I need numbers. I need facts. I need people in these companies who have since left to be this open and honest about what they were making. How insane is that? That you were at the top 1% of the company making $500 a month. That is the kind of impactful testimony we need to hear. And you bring up this incredible point about how it's difficult to re-rank. So even if you do hit this rank, even if you do get this big paycheck, staying there is a whole other challenge because there's all kinds of requirements for how much you have to sell, how many people have to be on your team and what they're selling. There's all kinds of quotas that you have to hit every single month to stay at the rank that you're at. Thank you so, so much for bringing that up. It developed way more anxiety and frustration than anything else in my life. The EOM end of month madness was a real thing. I feel like the anxiety triggers weren't not doing income producing activities, but the pressure from my uplines. The constant calls, messages, the nonstop WhatsApp chats, the late night trainings and calls, the pressure that I wasn't doing enough or my girls were not doing enough or that I wasn't training them correctly or telling them the right things. I always felt like everyone should do their business the way they wanted. Of course, I wanted them to succeed and be in my training calls because I wanted to feel respected, followed and listened to. I wanted people to feel proud of what I was putting together for them. All the sleepless hours I spent preparing trainings, presentations or in calls with other leaders to be able to help them with their businesses. I really, really wanted to be a good leader. I remember going to bed crying until I fell asleep because I felt I was not a good leader and that's why my team was not joining my calls or answering me. My upline was putting so much pressure on me. Sometimes she would call my girls and tell them what to do, but like pressuring them and my girls would call me later to tell me that that was not okay, that they did not feel she should have done that. This is another incredible perspective that I really haven't thought about before is that you were advised to put on trainings and that comes from you. You decide what the topic is, you decide how to present it. And a lot of that takes so much time and energy to put together. But as you're saying, you can't make people listen, you can't make people join the call. And ultimately all of that work could be for nothing. And you're not getting paid for the time that you're spending doing that kind of work. And I say this all the time on my channel, but the only income producing activities are signing someone up for the business or selling a product to them. All of the extra fluff, the trainings, the team calls, the texting, the posting, the cold messaging, none of that makes you any money, yet everyone does it because you're expecting that those things will increase the likelihood of you being able to make money. Months and months went like this. One day my upline got in a call with a couple of her top performers in her downline. One of my girls and I were on that call. I was at work that day and it was late. I joined the call just to listen because I didn't want to be called out in my real workplace. My upline was mad, like really mad. She started yelling at us because some of us didn't meet the goals for the previous month so she couldn't re-rank and wasn't going to get the car bonus for that month. I don't think you understand how validating this email is for me. And more importantly, validating for people who have been in this position. But this is just like so exhilarating because this is everything that I have said on my channel before. This is why the relationships get so toxic. People are stacked on each other. People were relying on each other. If you don't do your job, I don't get my car bonus. The car bonus programs are a huge scam because that's her car. She took out the loan on that car. She has to foot the bill for that because her teammates didn't bring Perform. And so you can imagine how horrible that situation becomes. And now you're on team calls with your upline screaming at you. I know that I'm interjecting a lot and I apologize for that, but I'm so fired up about this because this story right here is going to validate and help a lot of people. Fast forward, the following months were not the best for me because of my anxiety and other health related issues. I wasn't as present as before or doing calls. I just let it be. I sent a text to my team that I was going to step back until further notice and my uplines would help them in their businesses, but I would be there in case they had any questions. A few months later, my upline called me. This was after like five months of not talking at all. She had the audacity of asking me to resign so my girls could be her direct lines and she could get more volume to rank up. I was shocked. 
She didn't even ask me how I was doing with my health or anything else. Cause she doesn't care about that. Why would you care about someone's genuine health and genuine feelings when your money is on the line? Infuriating. When I was deep, deep in the MLM, I remember watching that Kathleen Lights video and she happened to mention the words monate and anti MLM in the same sentence. So I stopped the video and unfollowed her. At the time I'm following her again. Then last year I was exhausted and so overwhelmed by freaking monate and the community and the teams, etc. So I went back to YouTube to finish that video. Then from the recommended videos, I came across Deanna's channel and went down the rabbit hole. Then I found other anti MLM creators like Isabella, Chelsea, and you. After watching all of that, I never renewed my membership as a market partner again, and now I feel so free. I can literally cry. I'm so excited. I probably missed a lot of details, but tried to get some points across. I was not lazy. I worked my butt off, but the system is a scam. I know this was very long and all over the place, but thank you for reading it. If you have any questions at all, feel free to ask me. P.S. I'm very impressed by the way you speak. It's like you're a walking thesaurus or something like that. <laughs> I love learning new words and phrases. You're very well spoken. I love that. You're so sweet. Wow. PS number two, I have attached a picture of the email market partners receive immediately when they join. Ew. Let us look at this. It says, welcome to the family. Now that you're in business, it's time to start thinking about what you want from your new venture. Whether it's an extra $500 or $5,000, you are now in a position to decide how far you want to go and how fast you want to get there. To help you begin strategy, strategizing your Monet business plan, we've put together a short list of must-see resources to get you started. So it tells you about the Smart Start program, about the Market Partner Academy, and how to log into your back office. And at the bottom, it says, keep growing your Monet family. Nasty. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. This might be my favorite story I've ever read. I've definitely read other stories that are more like shocking, like they have crazy, crazy experiences to report, like being kidnapped. <laughs> but this kind of story is my absolute favorite because it's people who were in these MLMs who got to the top 1%, who are still coming out the other side of it, reporting negative experiences and validating everything that we talk about on this channel. Honestly, I could end this video here because I am sad satisfied enough with this one story. Thank you so, so, so much for sending that in. I cannot express enough appreciation. Of course though, I'm gonna keep sharing stories. And this next one says, when we first moved back, we were a bit young and irresponsible. Did you move away from your hometown and then come back? I'm not really clear on what this situation is. We both had challenging childhoods and the military definitely helped shape us. Okay, military, there we go. <laughs> but we still didn't fully have our shit together. My husband had gotten some traffic tickets for speeding and no insurance or something along those lines. He'd set up a payment plan to pay them. A few months into the payment plan, my husband went to make the monthly payment and end up chatting with the judge. In a district as small as ours, it isn't weird to see the judge because it's often just him and a clerk. This wasn't the first time they'd met because the reason my hubby was in the military in the first place was because he was given a go to war or go to jail option following bad teenage choices. So the judge and my husband were already acquainted. When they were chatting it up in the courthouse, the judge invited my hubby and myself over to his house for dinner. When he told me we were going to the judge's house to eat, I didn't know what to make of it. I'm from the city, so that was weird to me, but we thought, hell yeah, let's make the judge our friend. Couldn't hurt. I was around seven months pregnant at the time, so of course I followed the food. We get to his incredibly nice house and have a great meal and conversation. After the meal, he sat us down in the living room where he had an entire presentation thing ready with slides. He began his painfully long spiel about a company that could save us a ton of money on everyday products. I don't actually remember the name of the company, but from watching your videos, I believe it was Amway. Sounds like Amway to me. The pitch was about a ton of basic products like toothpaste, household cleaners, things like that. And he said, as a member, we would have access to massive discounts Counts on all of their products, which in turn would save us money because we would have to buy them anyway. This does sound like Amway. It also maybe could be Melaleuca. He then shifted to how we could even start saving our whole family money by signing them up as well. I was not at all familiar with MLMs, but from the start of the presentation, I felt some slightly scammy vibes. He put so much time and energy into this whole night and not to mention he's the judge. So we did actually entertain the idea. The only thing that made me listen to my gut was my unborn child. We were barely making it already and the startup cost it required wasn't something I was willing to skip buying diapers for. He continued to contact us after the dinner, attempting to recruit us, but we never gave in. I'm so freaking glad that we 
are able to stick to our guns because we would have most likely ended up struggling even harder to make ends meet with a new baby. I think back on it now and I'm a bit angry at the judge for trying to take advantage of his authority on a young couple starting a family and had no money to lose. He eventually stopped asking and never treated us any differently for not joining, but I have to wonder how many people he was successful with and how many of them were defendants. So wrong on so many levels. I don't even know what to make of this story. A judge recruiting defendants into his pyramid scheme. It's so inappropriate on so many levels because I would imagine that if you are the judge for a small town, you would have to kind of hold yourself to this higher standard. And maybe the people in the community kind of put you on this pedestal almost because you're the judge. And as you said, that can really easily be taken advantage of. I mean, how often are you invited to the judge's house for dinner kind of thing, right? And once you're there and once you're trapped in that situation, I feel like that's a really, really easy way to manipulate a lot of people. And that's not okay that he was using his power to do that. This story says, hey, Hannah, I love your channel and I've been binge watching for a while. This is going to be quite long. I have two stories I want to share. I've seen so many people in my family get involved in MLMs over the years. My mom, aunts, and cousins are usually the ones involved. Some of the companies they've been a part of are Mary Kay, Amway, Tupperware, ACN, Plexus, Monate, and LuLaRoe. Back in 2018, I almost, but not really, became involved with Beachbody. I had seen an ad on Instagram looking for 15 aspiring influencers who want to make money and help people reach their fitness goals. At the time, my relationship with my husband was rocky. We were struggling with money and I was getting desperate. Long story short, I reached out and began the process only to realize that it was for Beachbody. I already knew about MLMs, so I immediately stopped my efforts. I had gotten an email though from the person who posted the ad to check in and see why I didn't complete the application. So was it an actual person who had like an ad on Instagram? Like they paid for a sponsored ad or was it just a post? I know Beachbody in particular, they actually do run advertisements. There's a lot of Beachbody ads on my videos, for example. I don't get to pick which ads run. That's just YouTube's algorithm trying to match the content of the video to the advertisements. But this sounds like it wasn't Beachbody company like running an ad on Instagram. This sounds like it maybe was a specific person, like someone in Beachbody was creating that ad themselves. If it was just a personal post of theirs saying, hey, I'm looking for 15 people, that's fine. But if they tried to pass it off as like a sponsored or advertisement post, meaning they paid to put it there. That's actually against Instagram's policies and you can report that if you do see it. I explained that upon further research, it seemed like it was a scam and I was no longer interested. This was the email response I received. Oh, I'm excited. So the person in Beachbody said this to you. First, I am not offended in the least of your viewpoint on coaching. I totally understand why you would feel the way you do about network marketing companies. It's an antiquated viewpoint, but still parts of what you said is 100% accurate. Though I know at this point, I won't be changing your mind about coaching, nor is this my intent, but I do feel for my own peace of mind, you need to know the truth about pyramid schemes. I hope you'll read on. Buckle up for a classic pyramid schemes are illegal approach. I can already see it coming. I have not read ahead, but she's gonna say pyramid schemes are illegal. We're not a pyramid scheme. We're different because of X, Y, and Z. Here we go. Pyramid schemes are illegal, as alluded to by the word scheme. They are formed by people who gather funds and redistribute funds without any exchange of value, which naturally the pyramid will crumble at some point because you're printing money that doesn't exist, even if it is only when it reaches billions of dollars. See Madoff. Okay, so admittedly, I'm not like super familiar with every detail of the Bernie Madoff like Ponzi scheme case, okay? But my base understanding is that he would like get investors to pay a bunch of money into this scheme that was supposedly gonna make them so rich and then he would just pocket the money. What I don't recall is anything to do with printing money. <laughs> and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that printing money doesn't really have anything to do with if something is a pyramid scheme or not. Because what makes something a pyramid scheme is that you invest money and you recruit other people to invest money in the hopes that you will receive more money than you have invested. So personally, to me, her explanation of what she thinks a pyramid scheme is, is not accurate. So that's entertaining. Network marketing is perfectly legal and likely the best business model around. It's no different than owning a franchise, except there's no risk and the potential upside is the same. People who get screwed over by network marketing companies are the people who got it confused with a get rich quick scheme or joined and became totally ignorant to it because there was nobody there to hold them accountable. This is the longest sentence of my life. 
Oh, okay. Because there was nobody there to hold them accountable and they themselves didn't have the discipline to see through their goals. In other words, they didn't act like adults or business owners. Wow, okay, so the classic pyramid schemes are illegal claim, the classic it just didn't work for you because you didn't work hard enough claim. <laughs> What's next? For example, the people that say they lost money from being a coach, my question is how? The only mandatory monthly commitment is $15.95 and the upfront investment is guaranteed, which means that if they were at all attentive to their coaching business, they would have never lost a dime. They didn't lose money because of the business model, they did so because of their own ignorance. Excuse me, Beachbody does not guarantee you anything. Beachbody doesn't say, hey, if you just listen to our trainings, you are guaranteed to make your money back. That's not how that works, ma'am. Furthermore, no two teams within Beachbody are alike. For example, on our team, we could recruit hundreds of coaches every week and have them fend for themselves, but rather we carefully seek out people who see a connection with their values and ours so that we can teach them how to use social media to grow a viable business. Absolutely not, because you make good money when you recruit people. If you had 100 people lining up every week to join Beachbody, you would let them join. But that's not the case. People don't want to join Beachbody and that's why you have to carefully select a handful of people. Come on, give me a break. If you recall, the ad you responded to read, aspiring influencers wanted. And the reason I seek out aspiring influencers is because most people who aspire to be an influencer will never get there. Not because it's hard, not because it's complicated, but because most won't have the patience to stick to it long enough to get to that point, unless they have a means for monetizing their efforts along the way, i.e. as a member of team Wow. I might have to blur that name. That might be too identifying. But what she just admitted to is I'm preying on people who want to be an influencer because that's a very desirable thing to be for millennials in this day and age. And so by me saying that you will be an influencer, that will make you interested in my business opportunity. Anyway, I feel sorry that so many people are jaded by the network marketing business model and chose to spread that as a warning to others. Had I heeded those same warnings, I worry about where I would be today. Hopefully this email didn't come off defensive or offensive, LOL. I truly chose to address these emails because I am personally for network marketing and everything it stands for. I think it's the best business model around. And if I can plant a seed in anybody's mind that they should keep an open heart to it, then I feel I am serving my purpose. You are welcome to do with this information what you please, but I do hope to hear some feedback. Interesting what she chose to do with this information. <laughs> Hello, your email is being featured on an anti-MLM video. How about that? She's like, I hope I wasn't defensive following several paragraphs of being defensive. I did not respond back to her, but I did end up learning that this person has been one of the top 10 earners of Beachbody in 2017, 2019, and 2021 as well, which to me makes the whole situation even more gross because she knew exactly what she was doing. With creating the FOMO by saying that there were only 15 spots for her team and talking about how she's a millionaire and all her dreams have come true and blah, blah, blah. Absolutely abhorrent, honestly. That's definitely way more gross because she's at the top, she knows what it takes, she knows she has to recruit. And shame on her for creating an ad on Instagram claiming to make people into influencers. How disgusting. My second story focuses on a seemingly not well-known MLM, New You Life. I haven't seen any anti-MLM content on this company. They sell this product called Somaderm. It's a gel you rub on your skin and you supposedly get dosed with HGH. Okay, I need to look this up because I have not heard of this before. HGH is human growth hormone. It says it's important for growth, cell regeneration, and cell reproduction. It's a naturally occurring hormone in your brain. Healthline.com says that HGH helps to maintain, build, and repair healthy tissue in the brain and other organs. Also helps to build muscle mass, boost metabolism, and burn fat, okay? Going back to your email, you said it's one of those snake oil products that causes weight loss, cures cancer, boosts sex drive, cures depression, promotes hair growth, etc., etc. <laughs> you get the idea. Yeah, it does sound like a cure-all almost. My mother-in-law got involved in 2019. A few of her friends recruited her into it. My husband and I, the three of us lived together, tried to explain to her what MLMs are like and how the product doesn't work. First of all, there's almost no HGH in the gel. Secondly, HGH molecules are too large to even be absorbed into the skin. And third, it's impossible for one product to do everything it claims to do and cause no side effects whatsoever. At first, she seemed open to listening to us, but her upline and her team would have constant Zoom calls. 
and they would convince her that we were wrong. She then became convinced this gel was helping her feel better, despite the fact that she had recently lost 30 pounds due to being on Weight Watchers. She even had to use her insulin less, which was great and we were happy for her, but she blamed it all on the gel instead of her weight loss. And so she drank the Kool-Aid. She fell down the rabbit hole and believed all these testimonials of how much better people felt after using the product. She's not the best at budgeting, so she's strapped for money often. And so they also had convinced her how she would become a millionaire one day. She would insist my husband and I were haters and was genuinely upset we didn't support her. Her and her friends wasted money going to conventions and trips for the company. She was unsuccessful with recruiting anyone. She did though convince her mom to try the product. Fortunately though, she only purchased once and never again, which we were happy about because she's obviously older and living off of social security. It caused some strain on our relationship, but eventually it just became an off-limits topic of discussion as to avoid arguments. The last straw though was last Christmas Eve as she was wrapping gifts. She felt so overwhelmed about her money issues, she burst out crying in front of me because of how much she was struggling. It was honestly very sad. My husband and I then learned she was deeply in credit card debt and she had thought New You Life was going to be the one thing to help her. It's honestly disgusting how these companies target and prey on people who already have no money and then they end up being in a worse place than when they started. She's out of the MLM now, but she pretty much no longer speaks to her friends that were on her team and they were friends that she had had for years. Feel free to read this in one of your videos and keep doing the good work that you're doing. That's a heartbreaking story because she definitely drank the Kool-Aid. She definitely fell for it and she was buying into all of the false promises that it would fix her health, it would fix her money problems. And it seemed like it did strain your relationship in the beginning, but thankfully she's out now and I feel like she did kind of have that breakdown moment of like, I can't keep doing this anymore. And I'm really glad that she had you to kind of fall back on in that moment. This might be a little bit of a tangent, but I think that the way that you approach this is probably, well, it is exactly how I approach it. I have a lot of people that I love in MLMs currently. And the general rule is that we don't talk about it. We don't address it. I have my views, you have yours, but we don't bring it up to one another. We don't discuss it together. And maybe not everybody would agree with that approach, but the way that I feel about it is that I obviously have very differing views. I also feel like I've been doing this long enough. I've read enough stories to understand that being in an MLM is a short-term thing for most people. It's not sustainable. It's not a career. And there is going to be a day where those people get out of their MLMs. And when they do, I want to be there for them. And I don't want to burn any bridges. I don't want to cut them off as my friends. And that seems to be kind of the approach that you had as well. Like we just don't talk about it. And when the day comes, we will be there for you. And I love that. And also your Beachbody Hunt email was very entertaining. Thank you so much for sending that to me. This story says, hi, Hannah. Anna, as was previously mentioned, I really appreciate when you take the time to mute out strong language in your videos. Your horror story videos are my favorite to listen to. Thanks for providing an entertaining way to hear other people's stories. I have a few different MLM stories for you. Hardly horror, but hopefully still entertaining. In Bible college, I was part of a music and drama group that went on a two week tour. Our performances were held in churches and we spent our nights with different host families. It was prearranged before the tour who was staying where. Midway through the tour, myself and three other girls ended up staying with a couple in their 50s, I'd say. We rode with them home in their spiffy SUV and arrived at a gorgeous house in a nice neighborhood. Definitely the nicest place I had stayed in all tour. We were shown to our rooms and I couldn't help but notice the table in the basement full of Mary Kay products. So I asked, do you sell Mary Kay? She lit up and said, yes, I do. How have you heard of them? I told her that I didn't know much about it, but when I was younger, my dad gave me some Mary Kay makeup that he got from an auction. <laughs> As was the usual way of things, we spent the evening getting to know our hosts, making small talk and such. I remember that they had a pink toaster on the counter, which they were proud of. They also credited their SUV to Mary Kay. At least it wasn't pink. Another awkward moment in the conversation was when they were describing how Mary Kay worked and another girl piped up and said, oh, like Avon. They kind of scowled about that comparison and talked about how they were better because they didn't spend money on catalogs and advertising and thus were able to put that money into making better products. Yeah, right, okay. I was in a particularly goofy and outgoing mood and took it upon myself to share a funny video I made for an assignment where I acted out different roles. After watching that, they praised me until I blushed and said they thought I would be a really great salesperson for Mary Kay. At the time, I had low self-confidence and still do. I brushed off their comments. I thought they were very nice people. I had the opportunity to use some of the products myself in their guest bathroom 
bathroom and liked them. The next day, the girls were telling the team about how I was singled out and was going to be a Mary Kay rep. I laughed it off again and that was that. Until one random day when I was back home living with my family in our temporary housing situation due to the fact that our house had burned down. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. The phone rang and I answered. It was the lady from the tour. She called to say she would love to come do a party for me and my friends. How did she get my number? Maybe she had us write down our contact info and I don't remember. She lived three and a half hours away from me. I was surprised that she would come that far for a party. I really didn't want a party because most of my friends weren't local anymore. Plus it sounded like an awkward experience. They are an awkward experience. But luckily I actually had an excuse. I said, well, I can't really host a party because my house burned down. She was surprised to hear that and likely caught off guard. She suggested maybe doing it at a hotel. And I said, well, I don't actually have any friends either. She said, okay. And that was that. Oh my gosh, how horrible is that? Oh, you don't have a house? Your house burned down? Okay, let's do it at a hotel instead. What is wrong with people? My husband has told me stories of a boss of his at a small shop he used to work in. She sold immuno, immunocal, immunocal, now immunotech. Okay. She was very in your face about it and would tell everyone she met about it. When the customers came in, she would tell them to come up to her office so she could tell them all about it. He said it was awful. His parents, to their chagrin, also fell for a product from an MLM. He can't recall the company name, but they sold homeopathic vitamins. <laughs> now as a mother, I've been invited to different MLM parties. 31, Norwex, Monade, Young Living, and I have friends and acquaintances who sell for Rodan and Fields, Zaya, Tupperware, Sensi, Amway, and Plexus. Those are just the ones I can think of off the top of my head. At first, I was quite happy to go to the parties. The thing that made me uncomfortable about it all came from the personal messages. Um, no thank you person I haven't spoken to in years. I don't want to spend $200 on skincare, but sure, I'll be your guinea pig for your training call. I also purchased those infamous educational books from a Southwestern Advantage rep. My kids actually really enjoy them, but after hearing those testimonies on your channel, we can't look at them the same way. I remember the rep was a very sweet girl, but it was quite awkward that she had us write down any friends and their addresses if we thought they'd be interested. I honestly didn't know what an MLM was until YouTube enlightened me one day. And I was shocked to see all these companies that I personally liked on the list. Now I feel icky about the time I hosted a 31 party and got credit to order a bunch of things. I feel bad that someone signed up at that party. I feel like I could never make my anti-MLM stance public because I defend practically everyone I know and I'd look like a hypocrite since I supported them in the past. Thanks for reading and have a great day. That's kind of an interesting point that you left off on. The that it appears that you've been supportive of this business model previously. And so therefore coming out and saying, you know, I'm kind of against this. I don't think it's right. And taking that stance would sort of seem hypocritical. And I definitely get where you're coming from with that. It is really difficult to kind of take that stance and say, you know what? I am anti-MLM. I do not support this because unfortunately it feels like everybody knows somebody in an MLM and you always risk kind of putting that relationship on the line a little bit. And you never want your loved ones to feel personally judged by your opinions because you're not really judging them. You're judging the business model. You're judging the structure. But if at any point you do feel comfortable kind of taking that stance more publicly within your group of friends, I feel like that impact could be really powerful because becoming anti-MLM is one of those things where you don't know until you know. You don't fully understand the complexities of it until you've taken the time to learn about it. And for a lot of people that does change their mind, they used to support this one thing and then they've learned some things that they just can't forgive about it and now they can't support it anymore. And what I guess I'm trying to say in this very roundabout way is that doesn't make you a hypocrite. And I feel like taking that stance and explaining why you feel the way you do now could be really relieving for you and it could also be very powerful and helpful for other people as well. This story says, hi Hannah, I've fallen deep into the anti-MLM rabbit hole and I love your content and appreciate all you do. I'm so glad you decided to branch out into this because you're fantastic at it. Wow, that's so nice, thank you. I've had a million little brushes with MLMs, my grandmother selling Mary Kay, a former classmate trying to sell me Beachbody, another selling Thrive patches, a friend getting me to attend a 31 party she won, friends starting a LuLaRoe business, a mentor being high up in Jamberry, and so much more. However, while so many people talk about their high school classmates or Instagram friends trying to prey upon them, I didn't really start getting inundated with pitches until my husband and I started our own actual business. 
business. As we were starting from literally the ground up, we started getting involved in a lot of networking to try to get our name out there and just make connections in the local area. Little did I know how discerning I would need to become. One of the groups I joined was a local women's business group and I was almost immediately targeted by an Arbon Hun. I still don't know about MLM, so I naively took her up on her request for a virtual meeting, after which she pressured me into a party. I definitely didn't feel comfortable with it, but as someone who has always been shy and my husband was pushing me to do more networking, I chalked it up to just not liking to meet new people. Nope, I should have listened to my gut. The party was about what you would expect. I managed to talk two friends into coming. There was pressure to buy insanely overpriced skincare and a pitch to join her business, along with the story of how she left a fabulous high paying job because this was doing so well. I think she was a regional vice president, so she may have been, who knows. I just looked up the income disclosure for Arbon and the median annual earnings for the regional vice president rank is $58,000, which is not terrible money, but if she really did have like this fabulous high paying corporate job, it's unlikely that Arbon is paying her more than that if that is the truth. But I always urge people to take claims like that with a grain of salt because people in MLMs are always going to overrepresent what they're making. They're always going to overinflate the story. They're always going to play it off like they're doing so much better in their MLM than they were in corporate. Whether or not that's really the case, who knows? But that is what they're encouraged to say because that sounds really attractive to people who might be interested in joining the business opportunity. However, I wasn't interested and I ignored all of her attempts at follow-ups or asking me to sponsor women in shelters during the holidays by buying her crap. Are you kidding? She wanted you to buy stuff from Arbon and give it to people in shelters? I mean, nothing against being charitable, but if she wanted to be charitable, why wouldn't she just do that herself? Why does she need to sell it to you to make you go be charitable? What on earth? As I continued in networking, I learned a lot more about MLMs, so I knew to avoid the person trying to tell me I could sell wine at home, the MLM scout and seller, the makeup artist whose makeup always looked caked on and poorly color matched with spider lashes, the MLM unique. And I knew to decline all of those pampered chef invites. Even my husband was getting targeted by someone in one of the travel MLMs, we are in the travel industry, and some sort of financial one. But the mention of PV immediately tipped me off and I let him know to steer clear. Recently, I've started to look into paid networking groups as they only allow one professional per niche. The first I tried was a well-known national group that has chapters all over the country. Surely this was for legitimate business owners and professionals, right? Nope. Two of the first people to introduce themselves were MLM Huns from Primerica and Juice Plus. I have no idea if they are doing well, but paying $300 a year to try and shill that among other professionals, needless to say, I passed on joining. Then a friend recommended another women's group that she spoke highly of. I looked into it and it looked good. And there was an actual vetting process where they asked about things like your professional licenses and whether you carried any insurance for your business. Sounds like everyone would be legit, right? They even called me to ask about my business. The first Zoom event I attended had a political lobbyist and a children's book voice actor, so it looked like a good group to join. Then I get my first invite for the actual chapter meeting, and that's when I see it. The signature line of the chapter co-leader, Arbon Regional Vice President. So much for everyone being properly vetted for legitimate businesses and professionals. Ugh, okay, it's just one, and then there's a co-leader. We get to the first meeting, and the co-leader is in Color Street. So a lot of our meetings involve hearing about how much they love helping other women build a business. And because we are a supportive group of women, the Arbon Hun already recruited one member, gotten referrals from yet another, and managed to even rope me into a virtual pampering session. I couldn't quite nicely decline and I was pitched for both the 30 days to healthy living and the opportunity since I used my financial situation to decline to buy. The Color Street Hun has also been selling lots of nail wraps to most of the members and even got a member to shout her out in an interview she did on Stylish Gifts. I really have to bite my tongue every time she starts talking about the opportunity. The worst, however, was when during our final meeting of the year, we started talking about what we learned in our businesses and what we are wanting to do to grow in the next year. It seriously got to the point where I started taking notes because I felt like I was playing Hun Bingo and they were dropping so many buzzwords from the Color Street Hun, talking about identifying the runners to focus her time on, the phrase love on them in reference to her team. If you want longevity, you need to keep 
keep enrolling, consistency, positive self-talk, financial freedom. From the Arbon Hun, you can't want something for someone more than they want it for themselves, even when you know someone has so much potential. Doing the do, coachable, personal growth needs to be done every day. I think I need to make an MLM bingo card to keep me entertained during meetings next year. Apologies for the novel. I don't know whether to blame it on being a lawyer. I have yet to meet one who doesn't have a lot of words to say, or just finally having a space I can vent about this. But thank you again for all you do and for being you. Yes, Hun Bingo with all the buzzwords is so much fun. And isn't that sad that that's even a thing that we can do? The fact that there are just so many of these like generic self-help platitudes, motivational speeches, like it does not matter what rank you're at. It does not matter what company you're in. Everyone regurgitates the same stuff. And I think playing bingo with yourself would be a really fun way to keep yourself entertained. I do agree. And with that, my friends, that's all of the stories that I have for you for this MLM Horror Stories video. Thank you again to everyone who sent in their stories. And if you would like to send me yours in the future, the instructions for that are down in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you and I will see you in my next one real soon.